This all starts back on my second movie, which was a film called Schlock, which was John Landis's first film. It's a $30,000, really ultra low budget thing where John played the Schlock Thropus, which was this ape man type thing. I did the makeup on John. John, the way that all came about was I used to buy materials from this place called Don Post Studios. Don Post made these Halloween masks that they sold at Disneyland, and they were kind of high end masks that were pretty cool. And a lot of the materials I wanted to buy, like the rubber and the polyurethane foam and stuff, you could only buy in 55 gallon drums, which I couldn't afford and didn't have a place to put anyway. So I would go to Don Post and he would pour off some rubber in a gallon and sell me a gallon of rubber. I would always go in there and show him my stuff. John Landis, you know, was 21 years old, wanted to make this movie, wanted, it's originally, it was, it's kind of a, a, a parody of this film called Trog, which had, um, Joan Crawford in it, and this crappy ape man thing. He wanted a crappy gorilla suit, so he went to Don Post and said, you know, we want to, I want to, I've got, you know, 500 bucks and we need a crappy gorilla suit. And they weren't all that interested, but they said, you know, there's a kid that comes in here that buys material all the time, and he's made some gorilla stuff, and you might want to talk to him. So John came out to my parents' house. Again, I was still in my kind of shy, quiet stage, you know, and, and he's this very hyperactive, you know, loud guy. He walked into my bedroom, which is my little sacred space, and had all my masks and all this stuff. And he was like running around screaming and swearing and saying stuff, and just like touching my stuff and scaring me, <laughs> you know. And I was like, "This guy scares me," you know. But uh, but he had, the, you know, he wanted this ape man thing, and he decided to make it kind of cooler than what he originally thought when he saw the quality of my work, you know. So, anyways, to, to answer your question, as I was making up John Schlock, John had already written American Werewolf in London, virtually the same script that we photographed. Uh, and he said, my next movie is going to be an American Werewolf in London, and I want to do a transformation scene in a way that it's never been done before. And, you know, would you be interested? And I go, yes, I would. I mean, that's, I love that stuff. And I always loved the Wolfman and, the, and Mr. Hyde transformations and all that stuff, and had done a number of the lap dissolve style transformations myself, you know, with the eight millimeter stuff. And, and he said, but to him, it didn't seem right that he said, if you're changing, if your body's completely changing, and he wanted it to not be a wolf man, but a, a four-legged beast, that you wouldn't sit down in a chair like Lon Chaney Jr. and put your head in the corner of it and be really still until you finish changing. He said, you would move, and you would, there would be pain involved with your body transforming. And so he goes, I want you to figure out a way to do a transformation that isn't like been done before. It's like, okay, that sounds cool, you know, and it made, it made sense to me. You know, you wouldn't move and, and stuff. And John also said, you know, I think a lot of it can be cuts, you know, it's the same thing, you know, film is pieces of film put together. We can change makeup every time you see them, you know. So I went about trying to figure out how to do this, and what had happened is, you know, Schlock was not a big, big film, and it didn't, you know, nobody was like knocking down John's door to make his next movie, you know, so I mean, I think it was something like 10 years between the time he had talked to me about it and that we actually finally did it. So I had a really long time to think about it. and. That's when I started thinking, well, you know what? Again, the limitations of makeup. I, I agree with John. We could do a lot with cuts, which is changing every time you see him a different makeup. Actually, have you think you're seeing more, you know. But I said, you know, at one point, we should probably switch to a fake head that we could actually do something with, you know. And I was thinking, originally, the thought came from just the hair growing thing. I thought, if I made a rubber head of somebody and punched hair in it and pulled the hair in, and we reverse printed it, the hair would grow out, you know, instead of like the Wolfman, they'd lay a little bit of hair and then lay a little bit more and stuff, you know. And uh, so, so if, we, if I made a fake head, I could pull the hair in and we could actually see the hair growing right out of the guy's face, it'd be really cool. And that was, the, I thought, so I gotta make a head like that. And I started thinking about it. The more I thought about it, I thought, well, you know, if I got a fake head, I could push it out of shape and stuff too, you know, and it just kind of eventually evolved into what I ended up calling a change o head, you know, this head that physically changes on, on camera with no, no camera trickery, you know. And we made change then I thought, why does it have to be stuck with a head? It can be any part. So we made a change of hand and we made a change of back and change of legs and and I and then I also thought about I always liked I remember as a kid getting a magic book and they had this levitation trick where you had a couple like two by fours or broomsticks that you put shoes on the end and you you put a sheet over it and you put your head there like this and you could look like the body was levitating and in fact you're just like squatting up and down and those weren't really your legs you know it's like that I thought, you know, we could put the guy's body in the set and do a whole fake body you know and have his real head and real arms but this whole body be fake and kind of we you know I mean I had a lot of these ideas and you know and was 
so excited and anxious to do it, and then nobody was making this damn movie, you know? And it's like no, nobody wanted to know, you know, about the American Werewolf in London. And then one day I get a call from Joe Dante and Mike Finnell and said, hey, we want to do this movie called The Howling. It's a werewolf movie, and we want to do some really cool stuff. And I thought, all right, well, they're never going to make an American Werewolf. I'll do it for The Howling. And I started The Howling, and I started the design process and doing a lot of this stuff. And sure enough, you know, and then I get a phone call from John Landis and go, guess what? We're finally going to make American Werewolf in London. And it's like, oh, shit. You know, and it's like, it's like, well, guess what, John? I started doing this other werewolf movie. And he goes, you bastard, you son of a bitch. He was calling me against names. You, you, I was saying, oh, you were, this is for my movie. And he goes, okay, okay, I'll, I'll, what I'll do is, and this is at the time when Rob was my, like, you know, flunky assistant kind of guy, you know, I thought, I'll, I hurt myself when it's gone. <laughs> uh, I'll turn this show over to Rob and I'll do American Werewolf. You know, so they were kind of being done simultaneously. And he, I already said, gave him a lot of the ideas on how to do it. But Rob is a very creative and he's really got a really clever imagination. And he came up with his own, own take on how to do some of the stuff and, and, and the way that he thought that it should work. And so we both kind of went off in our own ways, you know. And, and, uh, but that's why I've got credits on both the films.